morning once again. Uh, we're going to pick up in our study in the book of Matthew. So if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 18, I think that will be helpful so that you can follow along. Matthew chapter 18. And here we've seen in the book of Matthew this idea of Christ as King. Time and time again throughout the book, Matthew is putting emphasis on Christ as the King. The coming king, the one that Israel had been putting their hope in, the one to whom the prophets had spoken about, but then also in connection to that, the kingdom that he would establish, the kingdom of heaven, and that becomes a theme also that runs through the book. In the last verse of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said that there are some who are standing here today who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And we saw in chapter 17, Jesus taking Peter, James, and John on top of that holy mount as Peter would call it later, and takes him up there and is transfigured before them. And his glory is revealed and manifested to them. And therefore they see Christ in his manifested glory in connection to this wonderful kingdom that he was about to establish. However, as wonderful and glorious as this kingdom would be, and as great as it would be in the sense that it was derived from heaven, uh, supplied through the work of Christ, and and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that would come, there were some uh, practical things that had to be considered as well. And Matthew chapter 18 is going to be a very practical book in speaking about the kingdom. You see, the kingdom was going to be dwelling upon and be established in a simple world. Yes, In a wonderful way, in a glorious way, it would be as though heaven, the will of heaven, was going to be accomplished on the earth. And God was going to send forth His Spirit, His instructions, His power, everything on the earth to His people, so that they could become the established kingdom of God on the earth. But yet, while we're here on the earth, we're in the midst of a simple and broken world. So how is that going to interplay? How is that going to work out? When you have the kingdom of heaven as glorious and wonderful and pure and majestic as that is, being in a world filled with sin, rebellion, and brokenness. How will these two play out? Well, Matthew chapter 18 is going to show us how practically we as citizens of the kingdom can interact with the world around us and even sometimes when the world creeps in among us and how we can respond in those various situations. So, if you wanted to break up this chapter, you could look at verse, verse 1 through 14 as dealing with how we should respond to sinners, repentant sinners who come to faith in Jesus Christ. Should we be receptive of them? Should we receive them freely as Christ had received them? Or should we push them away? Or should we put stumbling blocks so that they can't come and receive freely what Christ has offered? So it's going to deal more with sinners who are repentant sinners who are attempting to come into the kingdom. The last half, verses 15 through the rest of the chapter, will deal with what do we do when there's sin in the church? When there's sin, when a brother sins against you? Oh, is there a place for forgiveness once we're within the body of Christ? Once we become citizens within the kingdom, between one citizen and another citizen, what happens then when sin, when a person uh, breaks relationship or, or trust between you and another citizen, what should be done? So, if you wanted to sum up Matthew chapter 18, you could just say, sin. Sin, if you want to go a little bit more further than that, sin and its interplay with the kingdom, or the kingdom and the interplay of sin within the world. So let's just start out in verse 1. That's a good place to start. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And whenever you think about kingdom, and especially back then, during during the time of the Roman Empire, this great imperial empire that had taken over most of the known world at that time, in the midst of that great kingdom, and then also in the midst of, of people who, were, who felt uh, persecuted by this greater kingdom and, and wishing very deeply to become an independent state once again, to become an independent nation. 
And this idea of kingdom against kingdom and various wars that were taking place within this time, within the minds and thoughts of the disciples of Jesus Christ, when they hear about a kingdom that's coming, they're thinking power. They're thinking greatness. They're thinking of a kingdom that comes in great power. It comes and just pulverizes its enemies, overtakes the rest of the world in a very strong and mighty way. You might think about Nazi Germany uh, back in the 40s, you know, the way that they tried to acquire power through uh, weapons and tanks and all these other things, uh, technology. And maybe that's what comes to our mind. We think of kingdom, we think of power, and we think that those who are going to be greatest in the kingdom are going to be those with the most influence and with the most power and who can wield themselves over everybody else and acquire a position within that kingdom. But even further, because they were Jewish in their mindset, they would also tie together not only the idea of a kingdom and a nation uh, in, uh, in a political sense, but also in a religious sense as well. Because here, in their minds, they would be thinking too, well, the greatest in the kingdom would be those who are morally upright. It would be the pious ones. It would be the God-fearers. It would be like the Pharisees and Sadducees, the the ones who have high esteem before everybody else, who seems to have it all together, who seem to have a righteousness that exceeds everybody else's righteousness and are very quick to let you know just how righteous they are. And so perhaps they were looking for and thinking that those who were greatest in the kingdom would be those who were the most pious, those who were the most religious, those who were the most righteous. How did Jesus answer well, yet he answered in a way that they probably did not expect. In verse 2, And he called a child to himself and set him before them. Didn't set a great, mighty military leader before them, nor did he set a, a high-esteemed Pharisee before them, or some other type of religious icon before them. Just set up a child. We don't even know the child's name. A nameless child, at least from our standpoint, is brought before the disciples. And this is what Jesus is going to use. This person is what he's going to use to illustrate who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Can you just imagine what's going through the disciples' mind as he does this? We expect it because we know the story. We've all, uh, I believe all of us here are probably familiar with this particular story. We know how it ends. We know how it continues on through the New Testament. We know what Jesus is talking about. The disciples who have seen this for the first time are probably flabbergasted. Their jaws uh, hanging down, wondering what in the world is he, is he getting at. Well, he goes on to explain in verse 3. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. A child. A child who can do nothing of his or herself. A child who, especially in this society, had no position, had no power, had no say-so in political affairs. A child who wasn't, not only not physically strong enough to accomplish anything for his or herself, but hadn't quite had the experience, had the mental capacity to do anything for his or herself. A child who had become helpless in the midst of a society, especially a society as ruthless as the society that they lived in at that time. Jesus said the greatest was not the politically, politically elite or the religiously looked up to prestigious uh, scholars and scribes, but a child, a meek and humble child. Those would be the ones who would be greatest in the kingdom. Those are the ones who would find entrance into the kingdom. A child is basic, a child's life, when they're young, is completely built upon trust. Completely built upon trust. A child lives on trust, they eat on trust, they breathe on trust, they do everything by trust. Why? Because they have to. A child can't do anything on their own. They can't go out and get a job and get an apartment, they can't go out and earn a living and, and acquire food for themselves. Uh, they can't supply their own medical needs. Uh, they can't even supply their own emotional needs. A child is completely and utterly dependent upon others for everything that they receive. And that's why it's so hurtful and painful when we see children in whom that trust is broken. 
who are completely and utterly dependent upon this idea of trust, and that trust is broken because an adult wasn't trustworthy. Uh, it's heartbreaking. Uh, but that's what children live on. They thrive on trust. They have to trust others to supply their basic needs, their emotional needs, everything. And so this is how God was going to establish his kingdom. He was going to establish it and build it upon those who had absolute trust in someone else and no trust within themselves. Those who realize, I don't have the strength, I don't have the ability, I don't have the righteousness, I don't have the power, the prestige, the knowledge, the intellect, go on, you name it, whatever it might be, I don't have it. It's not within myself to enter into this kingdom. I must have someone else step up, step up beside me and bring me into this kingdom. I have to be dependent upon someone else. And of course, as we all know, as we continue to read the story, who we must be dependent upon is Christ, the one who has been supplied for us, the one who gives us the full supply, who gives us entrance into the kingdom. No one comes to the Father except through me, he would say uh, there in the book of John. So those who would be the greatest would be those who, learn to be, who would learn to depend the most upon the Father and upon the accomplished work of Christ. And this makes sense when you think about it. Initially, it wouldn't have made sense to the disciples, but when you think it fully through, it does make sense. Why? Because those who are not strong in themselves, don't feel like they have anything in themselves to accomplish anything, but truly rely upon God, guess what happens? They have God working through them to accomplish all that they need and all that those around them need. So they have the power of God working through them to accomplish things. Uh, what did Paul say? Remember when Jesus, uh, when he had that thorn in the flesh and he prayed three times that the Lord would take it out of him, uh, Christ came to him and said, my power is made perfect in weakness. It's when you can get out of the way, when you stop trying, when you start stop trying to do it in your own strength, that God's power can flow through. So which is better? Which is greatest? Which person is greater? The one who has God's power flowing through them, his grace available to them because they are humble. As James chapter 4 says, he gives grace to the humble. Those who have God working through them because they've gotten out of the way and let him do, do the work. Or is the person greater who says, oh, I can do it my own, on my own strength. Uh, I'm righteous enough on my own. Uh, i got enough ability and capability to do this. Uh, people look up to me. I'm, I'm a prestigious person in this particular society or whatever, and I can do it and, blo and block the flow of God's power in their, in their life because they're doing it all on their own. Which one's greater? The one who can humble himself. It's the one who says, I can't do it on my own, but I've placed my absolute trust in another. But then there's a practical aspect of this. This all perhaps sounds good that you know, we put our trust in the Lord. We realize that we're sinners and capable of achieving this righteousness on our own. And we realize that this kingdom is a kingdom that, if we refer back to chapter 16, was a kingdom that was established upon... The truth that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, in whom, as Paul would say, I'm sorry, Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 2, these living stones would be built upon that foundation, being built up into a spiritual house, made up of these living stones that are repentant sinners, people who come from a sinful past, who come from a broken path, past, and place their trust in Christ. These are the ones upon which this kingdom would be built. There might become a practical problem with this. Because what you find is, is that, yes, God's accomplished work through Jesus Christ is for everybody and anybody, everywhere. It's for anyone who will humble themselves and come to the kingdom. But oftentimes, within those who are in the kingdom, within the citizens of the kingdom, we don't always see it that way. Maybe we're not as open to receive sinners as Christ is. And this might become a problem, a big problem, when it comes to people who are repentant sinners who are wanting entrance into the kingdom. What do they find when they come to us? Let's continue to read, and, and we'll see this uh, be fleshed out by Jesus' teaching here. He says in verse 5, And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble... It would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So he says, okay, 
Uh, this person humbles himself. He realizes he can't do, it, do anything in his own strength. Like a child, he puts his utter trust in me, complete uh, trust in me, and he comes into the kingdom. If you receive such a one, a humble person like that, you receive him in the kingdom, hey, it's just like you receive me. Everything's good. It's one and the same as if you receive me. But, if you put a stumbling block in that person's path, that person has humbled themselves, they believe in Christ, they want to put their trust in Christ, but we put a stumbling block there, we put a barrier there for them coming into the kingdom, that's not good news. Jesus says, it'd be better for a millstone to be hung around your neck and you'd be thrown into the sea than to allow that to happen. So how is it that we can put these stumbling blocks up? Well, it starts off with, with the wrong attitude. It starts off with us saying, well, yeah, Christ died for everybody like me. <laughs> everybody who has my type of past or are a part of my particular social class or my own ethnic group or racial group. It's, it's whoever is, is like me. Those are the ones I received by Christ. It starts with an attitude that says, yeah, Christ these, Christ will freely receive these people, but these people over here, mm, no, it's not going to happen. Because of their past, maybe they've been involved in drugs or prostitution or you name it. We have a particular category of people that are the untouchables, that we do not, we differentiate between this group and this group. These will share the gospel with. These will receive into the church. These will work with, with those we won't touch him with a 10-foot pole in our minds. So it starts with the wrong attitude. And that becomes, in and of itself, a stumbling block. But then it happens, because we have that attitude, that we only share the gospel with these people. We see the people at work that we think have the greatest potential. We, we go to the people in our neighborhood who is much like ourselves. Maybe have a history similar to us. And so we think, yeah, these people are just what Christ is all about. This is, these are the type of people that Christ will receive. And then we ignore this group over here. And we just don't, simply don't share the gospel with them. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 10? How can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless somebody tells them, preaches it to them? And so that becomes a stumbling block because we've turned a deaf ear, a blind eye to this group because we think, no, we're either afraid of them or we're repulsed by them and therefore we're not going to share anything with them. Barrier, stumbling block to them coming into the kingdom. Better that you have a millstone. A millstone was a heavy stone that they used for grinding grain, making it into flour. Heavy, heavy stone. Better to have that millstone hung around your neck and you'd be cast into the sea than that you would reject, put a stumbling block before these little ones. These ones who are humbling themselves, who are coming to me and wanting to receive the kingdom. Another way that we can put up stumbling blocks is by not being careful in the way that we speak and in the things that we post on social media. When we post things that are hateful or things that are that seem to alienate people, maybe because of our political views, we're insensitive to how this might affect certain people who will see these certain things or hear these certain things. They automatically receive that and process that as saying, well, the church is not for me. The church I'll never be able to be a part of those people because of their ideas and their views. We just have to be very careful. The way that we speak, the things that we post, the things that we, even our uh, nonverbals that we give, we need to understand that Christ died for everybody, anybody, everywhere, and that the gospel message is for anyone who will humble themselves, realize that they cannot receive anything in and of themselves and are ready to place their trust in Jesus Christ. doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter their history. It doesn't matter anything else. As long as they have that attitude, that's what the kingdom is for. So Jesus said, don't put any stumbling block in front of anybody who wants to come into the kingdom. Why is it so serious? Well, think about it. When we're talking about entrance into the kingdom, we're talking about people's eternal salvation. The difference between eternal salvation and eternal condemnation. Imagine if at the end of the time, when you're able to look back on your life, you realize 
And maybe it's revealed to you that this particular individual didn't come to Christ because of some stumbling block you put in their way. Whether individually as a person or collectively as a people, how horrible that would be to see someone separated from Christ forever because of something that we did, because we had put that barrier before them. Better that a millstone be hung around your neck and be cast into the sea than you cause one of these little ones to stumble. We need to be receptive of all. He says in verse 7, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. So he's saying, you know what, the world, of course there's stumbling blocks there. There's a lot in the world to keep people, or to, yeah, to be barriers for people coming to the kingdom. Riches, money, sex, drugs, whatever you want to put on the list, all are stumbling blocks that keep people from, that keep them trapped in sin, keep them trapped in themselves, and keep them from being able to enter into the kingdom. There's plenty of stumbling blocks in the world. And yes, it's true, there will be stumbling blocks, but what Jesus is saying is, you don't be one of them. Yeah, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks will come. That's just the nature of the world, but you don't be one of them, is his point there. Verse 8, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame.